Okay, so today we're going to look at the principles behind ultrasound imaging for medical diagnostics. By the end of today, you should be confident to be able to state the individual steps that are taken in ultrasound imaging and use the correct equations with it. Uh, most of you should be able to confidently apply attenuation equations to ultrasound imaging uh, and you might start to think about uh, critically evaluating different types of imaging techniques, um, so comparing uh, x-rays, MRIs and uh, CT. Eventually we're going to add on one more, which of course is MRI, um, but that's going to come in a future lesson. So let's start off by thinking about what actually is ultrasound. Um, obviously, we measure most sounds uh, with a frequency. So, ultrasound is defined as anything over the range of human hearing. Uh, now, typical human hearing uh, tends to start to fade off at about 16,000 hertz. But by convention, we say that human hearing is between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. So, anything above 20 20 kilohertz is ultrasound, uh, and that's the range of sound frequencies that ultrasound uh, for medical applications uses. The heart of most ultrasound systems is a device called a transducer, which uses an array of piezoelectric crystals. A piezoelectric crystal vibrates when an electric signal is applied, producing high frequency sound pressure waves, which we call ultrasound. More importantly, this type of crystal can also work in reverse. It can produce electrical signals when it detects high frequency sound pressure waves. When a transducer directs ultrasound waves into the body, they pass right through the skin and into the internal anatomy. As the waves encounter tissues with different characteristics and densities, they produce echoes that reflect back to the piezoelectric crystal. This happens more than a thousand times a second. Returning echoes are converted to electric signals, which a computer converts into points of brightness on the image, corresponding to the anatomic position and the strength of the reflecting echoes. A medical transducer contains a large array of crystals, which allow it to make a series of image lines that, together, form a complete image frame, called a sonogram. In addition, all the crystals are repeatedly activated many times in such a way that a complete image frame is formed around 20 times per second, so that real-time motion is displayed in the ultrasound image. So the first thing we're going to think about is how we actually produce ultrasound. Uh, an ultrasound is produced uh, by something called a piezoelectric crystal. Now piezoelectric crystals have the uh, nice use um, that their structure changes when you apply a voltage to them. Um, so uh, we can use the motor action of a piezoelectric crystal, which means that when we apply a voltage in one direction, uh, they stretch and you then get longer. When you apply a voltage in a different direction, uh, they get shorter. Um, so what that means is, um, if I have a piezoelectric crystal here, and I connect it to an alternating current generator, then that's going to vibrate backwards and forwards, and so produce uh, waves, in this case, sound waves. Now, if I make that, uh, let's say, just for argument's sake, 50 kilohertz, then what I'm going to get there is a pulse of ultrasound. What's even more useful about these electric crystals is they actually work in reverse. So they have, so this was, uh, we were just talking about motor action, they also have a generator action. So if I have incoming sound waves and I apply them to a piezoelectric crystal, then what I get out is an alternating current. Uh, and that will again alternate with the received uh, waves. So I can use this to receive uh, pulses. I can send out a pulse of ultrasound, and then I can listen for the echo back at my transmitter or transceiver. Uh, now we need to understand a little bit about uh, ultrasound uh, resolution. So resolution is the idea of the smallest object that is indistinguishable from a different object. Um, so here you can see good resolution as I have, uh, so this would be my ultrasound uh, transducer here. And this would be two objects in my patient. 
Um, so good resolution is I can clearly see the outline of these two objects. Poor resolution occurs when I have uh, those objects appearing to overlap uh, in, on my image. Um, now to think about uh, what the resolution likely is, um, we need to know that the velocity of sound in the human body uh, is in the region of 1,500 meters per second. Uh, so uh, I've told you before that we're using things in the ultrasound range. So a typical ultrasound frequency uh, would be around uh, 2 megahertz. So if we use our good old friend v is equal to f lambda, we get a wavelength uh, there uh, will be 1500 divided by 2 times 10 to the 6. Uh, so that comes out as 7.5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters. Um, so about 1 millimeter. Now we're going to talk about this a bit more when we do communications, um, but basically speaking, um, the wavelength of the wave is usually, for, well pretty much all waves, that's going to be our maximum resolution. Um, so we've stumbled upon the first big downside of ultrasound compared to x-rays, and that is that their resolution are, is relatively small. Um, you can use them for imaging things like muscles, uh, tissue groups, and even babies, which are relatively large. But if you want to look at something really small like uh, capillaries, ultrasound is not the one. Now, you might be thinking, well, okay, what about if I just boost frequency? Uh, if the frequency goes up, then wavelength will go down. Um, which is a good idea. Unfortunately, what we discover is that at much higher frequencies, uh, the body, uh, sorry, the much higher frequencies don't tend to uh, transmit very well uh, through human skin, so it doesn't doesn't really work. So what do we have inside an ultrasound probe? Um, they're pretty simple uh, when you think about the design. Uh, what we have is our piezoelectric crystal. Uh, which is near the front of the probe usually. Um, so that is what is producing and receiving the vibrations or the waves or the ultrasound. Uh, but obviously we need a, a pair of electrodes. Those are connected to a signal generator uh, as well as an amplifier. So uh, it's created to a signal generator uh, when transmitting and an amplifier when receiving. They have a backing block, uh, that's what it seems to be called um, on most examples, um, but CIE in their infinite wisdom uh, have called the backing block damping material. Um, and the point of the damping material um, is basically so that uh, any uh, waves that start to go this way, they fade out um, until they are stopped. Because what we don't want is for them to start reflecting back here um, and travelling back to the uh, piezoelectric crystal, um, because that would uh, obviously um, ruin our signal because we'd get just a lot of reflection from inside. So that, that damping material is, um, is really important. And then obviously we need uh, some sort of cable that will uh, send the signal backwards and forwards. Um, and that's pretty much all you need to know about how the crystal is produced. Okay, so let's start thinking about how we actually produce an image uh, through ultrasound. So what I've got here is a picture that you might be fairly familiar with, um, and this is just refraction. Now if you think back, um, refraction as a definition is the bending of a wave caused by a change in speed. And you know about Snell's law uh, for light waves, but it should be fairly obvious to you, uh, if you think about it, that 
Refraction will happen with any type of wave. Whenever a wave goes from one speed to another, um, the principle of uh, the wavefront is changing direction. That's going to stay the same. Now, what we're going to do is kick it up a notch and think a bit more a level -y. Um, if you remember from your GCSE stuff, we know that it always bends uh, if it's going from a less optically dense to a more, sorry, in this case, less dense to a more dense material, it will bend towards the normal. But what you should remember is that a proportion of the wave is also reflected. Um, and it's this reflected ray that we're interested in, or wave that we're interested in. So we're going to make it a little bit simpler, and we're just going to think purely about a wave traveling directly down. So in other words, if this is my normal, we will think about a wave entering at 90 degrees to the normal, so an angle of instance of equal to zero. So to work out uh, how what fraction of the wave is uh, reflected, we're going to use a new equation. Um, and that equation uh, relies on a new property called acoustic impedance, uh, which in physics has the equate as symbol Z. Now, Z is equal to rho C, where rho is the density of the object, same uh, as you've used your rho before, and C, as I'm sure you could probably guess if you think about it, is the speed of sound in that object. So what we find um, is that all we have to do is multiply the density of a material by the speed of sound and we get acoustic impedance values. Now what we're usually interested in is the reflected intensity. So we need, we care about intensity. So to calculate reflected intensity, uh, we're going to, or to calculate things to do with intensity, we're going to use this equation. Um, we're going to think about the intensity of the ray that is reflected over the incident intensity, or I0, that is the intensity entering the uh, object. So we'd have uh, I0 here, IR here. And it turns out that provided the angle of incidence is zero, so provided the angle of incidence is equal to zero, um, we can say that the reflected intensity over the incident intensity is equal to Z2 minus z1 squared over z2 plus z1 squared. So these z numbers, remember, are the acoustic impedances of the materials. So what you can see is that the greater the difference in acoustic impedance, the greater the fraction of uh, sound or of intensity um, that is going to be reflected. So let's think about a word example here. I'm just gonna, this is the same word example as in your book, um, but uh, it's, it's just a good bit of practice. Um, so let's think about uh, this case, and we're just going to think about uh, going from muscle to bone. So what fraction here goes through, and what fraction comes out? So we're going to call Z1 is muscle, because we're going from muscle into Z2, which is bone. So you can see from my table, uh, the acoustic impedance of muscle is 1.71, and the acoustic impedance of bone is 6.40. So remember, we are using the equation, the, the ratio of reflected to instant intensity is Z2 take away Z1 all squared over Z2 plus Z1 all squared. 
So that gives me 6.40 take away 1.71 squared divided by 6.40 plus 1.71 squared. Uh, and that comes out as 0 0.33. So that's the fraction. So I can say that 33% of the sound is reflected. Um, now if you have a look, uh, we said before that when you have the, the bigger the change in acoustic impedance, uh, the bigger the proportion that is reflected. Um, so straight away, if you look at this table, we've got a big problem. If we go from air into uh, well, soft tissue there, you can see that I'm going from 0 0.0004 to 1.63. That's a massive change. Um, so about 99% um, of the uh, instant sat, uh, instant wave would be reflected. Um, so what we do instead um, is we put a uh, layer of uh, gel um, on the patient's skin. Um, this is called impedance matching. So what we do is we place this uh, ultrasound gel or jelly on the patient's skin um, and it has a very, very similar acoustic impedance uh, to skin and tissue. So the idea is we get very little reflection there um, and that means that we have enough intensity travelling through the patient to get a signal. So what about the actual signal that we get? How can we use this to produce uh, a, a signal. Well, if you look um, here, you can see the kind of idea of what we're doing. This is called an A-scan. And what happens is uh, we send a pulse of ultrasound out and straight away we're going to get some reflected uh, ultrasound back to the probe. So what we can do is we can plot this on a graph of signal strength against time. So I send my pulse here and I start a clock, I start timing. And so you can see straight away I'm going to get quite a big signal as it comes back from the abdominal wall because I haven't perfectly impedance matched. The rest of the wave will be transmitted through the patient's skin until it gets to uh, let's say this organ and then a fraction is going to be reflected back. Now, because it has to travel further, it takes longer to get back. So I see a peak at a different time. And you can see that I get a range of different peaks at different times. Now, what I can do is I can turn that into a B scan. And a B scan just has the intensity as color or uh, black and white. So we could say that the more intense, the whiter the dot. If it's not intense, you get a black dot. Um, and that's quite important because we can then build up a pattern. So what, how a regular ultrasound works is if we want to image this ring here, then I can get a series of B scans where each scan builds up. So I can see here, I'm getting dots appearing where I'm getting some reflection. Um, so I get reflection as it enters uh, the, the ring and then I'm getting more reflection as it leaves the ring. So you can see that by combining lots and lots of different uh, A, B scans um, through an array, I get an image built up. Um, so each of these is an individual transducer. So I can build up a signal like that, um, and that way I can very quickly um, start to see images, I can see uh, the organs, and uh, this is particularly good for looking at unborn babies because there's no radiation involved. Um, now there's one more thing that you need to know about, um, and that is the intensity. So uh, we do have, uh, like all things, intensity drops off uh, with distance. 
Um, and like you might be familiar, it follows uh, the equation intensity is equal to I0 to the negative alpha x. Uh, and this should now look really, really uh, familiar with you to you. X is the distance into the tissue. I0 is the initial intensity. Uh, and alpha is another absorption coefficient. Um, now in ultrasound, the much, uh, what creates much more signal um, is the reflected waves. So in practice, we don't tend to worry too much about calculating intensities or, or um, dealing with the fact that intensity will drop off with distance um, because it's not, it's not hugely uh, relevant to us. Uh, it's not the biggest factor. However, CIE may well decide to test you on it, so you really do need to make sure that you know it. Uh, one more thing, just to make sure that you know, um, obviously if you want to measure the thickness here, so the thickness, um, hopefully it is fairly self-explanatory to you, um, but obviously um, it's worth remembering that that will of course be the distance uh, travelled divided by 2, so distance travelled by ultrasound. And we know that the distance travelled by ultrasound is uh, the speed of the ultrasound, which I'm going to call C, multiplied by the time interval. So delta T would be the time from when I sent my pulse whoops, to when I received my pulse. Um, so this equation is one that you might need um, if they have uh, this kind of graph. Then you can read off your T values from the graph. Um, and then use this equation to calculate the thickness of something. Uh, but hopefully, you're all at year 13 physicists, that should be pretty obvious to you anyway. Okay, there's not much to ultrasound, it's pretty simple. Um, you can use pages uh, one five, sorry, 516 to 521 of your textbook to have a little look through this as well before we go through it in class. Um, but I hope you'll agree that compared to uh, CT scans, certainly, this is uh, quite a lot simpler. Um, it's really cool, it's really exciting, um, but hopefully you won't, uh, this will be fairly clear for you. Of course, if it isn't, please do come and chat to me during the lesson, and I will be more than happy to go through it with you. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I'll see you in our next class. Thank you for watching.